There have been a lot of comments from atheists recently. Some tell me I don't know anything about evolution. Some tell me I don't know anything about the geological timescale. And the most reasonable and authoritative tell me I know nothing about the universe and about Einstein's relativity. They all bombard me with all the things I used to believe when I was an atheist. I understand their frustrations. I also wanted those theories to be true and argued vehemently for them. I was in the situation described in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 10 and 11. They received not the love of the truth that they might be saved, and for this cause God shall send them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie. I did studies in geology at one university, biology at another, astronomy at a third, and applied maths at a fourth. I believed in those millions of years. I believed the evolution stories. I believed the astronomical stories. I believed the relativity stories. But after I met the Lord Jesus Christ, I was gradually set free from the strong delusions I've invited into my life. I started to see how untenable all those stories are. The most reasonable and well-argued comments from atheists have been about Einstein's relativity. So here I'll try not just to give my thoughts, but to give statements made by people recognised as experts in physics and by people who were associated with Einstein. One of the great geniuses of the last century, Nikolai Tesla, said, Einstein's theory of relativity is a magnificent mathematical garb which fascinates, dazzles, and makes people blind to the underlying errors. The theory is like a beggar clothed in purple whom ignorant people take for a king. Its exponents are brilliant men, but they are metaphysicists rather than scientists. Louis Essen, world expert on the physics of time and its measurement, and the inventor of the atomic clock, said that relativity is not really a physical theory but simply a number of sometimes contradictory assumptions. Ernest Rutherford called the theory simply nonsense. Harold Nordinson said, Relativity is not physics, but philosophy, and in my opinion, poor philosophy. Professor Herbert Dingle, who we met in episode 69, was one of the foremost experts on the theory of relativity. His book, The Special Theory of Relativity, was the standard textbook in both British and American universities for years. He conferred with all the accepted experts on the theory, including Einstein, Eddington, Schrödinger and Born. But he came across the very simple proof we looked at in episode 69, showing that relativity is untenable as a theory about reality. We'll look again at this simple proof and the expert's response to it in a few minutes. When Dingle's eyes were opened to the folly of relativity, he said, how is it possible that such an obvious absurdity should not only have ever been believed, but should have been maintained and made the basis of almost the whole of modern physics for more than half a century? And that even when falsity was pointed out, its recognition should have been universally and strenuously resisted, in defiance of all reason and all the traditions and principles of science. Dingle also noticed, if Einstein's paper had never been written, all the experiments now held to prove Einstein's theory 
would still have been performed and held with the same conviction to prove Lorenz's theory. Einstein himself gave away the unreality of his theory in an address at Princeton University where he said, If we think of a wagon moving along a street, we know that it is possible to speak of the wagon at rest and the street in motion, just as well as it is to speak of the wagon in motion and the street at rest. This is an admission that his theory is about appearances, not reality. If there were a wagon in the next street going in the opposite direction, it's just as valid to think that wagon is at rest and that street is in motion, in the opposite direction to the first street. Or even more ridiculous, in the same street, we have one wagon going in one direction and another wagon going in the opposite direction. So it's just as valid to say the wagons are stationary and the street is going in two opposite directions at the same time. This may be acceptable as a theory about appearances, but utter nonsense if it's supposed to be about reality. And that brings us back to Dingle's proof from episode 69, that relativity can't be a theory about reality. If you have two exactly similar clocks, A and B, and one is moving with respect to the other, they must work at different rates. But the theory requires that you cannot distinguish which clock is moving. It's equally true to say that A rests while B moves, and B rests while A moves. How does one determine, consistent with the theory, which clock works the more slowly? Unless this question is answerable, the theory requires that A works more slowly than B and B works more slowly than A. This is clearly impossible. A theory which requires an impossibility cannot be true. Well, of course, the answer is very simple. According to Einstein, an observer at clock A will see clock A behaving normally and the one at B running slowly, whereas an observer at B will see clock B behaving normally and the clock at A running slowly. The slowing down of either clock is only apparent to the observers and both actually run at exactly the same rate all the time. Now, that's so simple, straightforward and obvious. Why couldn't the experts Dingle challenged give him a straight answer? Let's look at one of the leading relativists of the time, William McRae, gave us an answer. We have five and a half pages of erudite words sprinkled with equations. A totally irrelevant world line some reasoning and talk of correspondence between two events E1 and E1A, he then says we learn nothing by setting up this correspondence, and so there is nothing in it to be contradicted or to contradict anything else. But what about which clock runs more slowly? Not a word. How can we explain that? Well, I would say that McRae probably got his PhD in relativity. He published a whole stack of papers on relativity. He was awarded his professorship for his work on relativity. And his fame and reputation depend critically on relativity. Would you really expect him to admit that relativity is exactly what Nikolai Tesla said? And Ernest Rutherford said, In 1954, Einstein wrote to a friend called Basso, I consider it quite possible that physics cannot be based on the field concept, i.e. continuous structure.
In that case, nothing remains of my entire castle in the air, gravitational theory included, and of the rest of modern physics. Well, he and the physicists who fell under his spell should have taken note of Tullio Levi Civita, a leading developer of tensor analysis. Tensor analysis is the basis of general relativity. Two years after Einstein published his general relativity, Levi Civita published a paper showing that Einstein's tensor analysis is not valid. Stephen Carruthers has made a YouTube video, The General Theory of Relativity, explaining this lack of validity and the fatal consequences for the Big Bang, black holes, and everything else flowing from Einstein's faulty theory. But why does the establishment ignore this? and all the other evidence that Einstein's relativity is untenable. Well, they still need Einstein and his denial of the ether to explain away the evidence that the Earth is not moving. And horror of horrors! If the Earth isn't moving, there might even be people prepared to consider the biblical model of the universe, which we looked at in episodes 46 to 49 the model described in Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Thank you for joining me for this episode. If you enjoyed it, please like, subscribe and press the bell so that you'll be notified as I release new movies. If you'd like to support this project, you're welcome to do so through Patreon. Find a link on my channel banner and in the description below.